I'm recovering from people pleaser syndrome <laughs> is when you overcommit and you just say yes to all kinds of stuff because you want to please everybody because it makes you feel good. You end up delivering on nothing. Y'all have a bit of an ego. We don't want to get hurt, this and that. We don't want to look silly. When you do it that way, you're also protecting your integrity and you don't feel as rejected by the client because that's on them, not you. So if we can come in super prepared, if it's a family member, let them see you in a different light, kind of pattern interrupt them and holy cow, I haven't seen this side of Colton before. This is incredible. So I want to talk about a, uh, something today that I think I would say most real estate agents, whether new or experienced, struggle with, and, and that is serving versus pleasing mm. clients and making the mass distinction. And I think it's something that a lot of agents struggle with badly because of, well, what we're about to unpack in today's episode. So I'll tee this up. And like always, I wanna get your guys' thoughts and feedback. So when you look at both of these things, especially in our business of, of what does it mean to serve a client, to serve a seller versus the need to please a seller. The best way when I think about that is this, that serving somebody has to do with what is best for them and pleasing someone has to do what's best for you. Let me explain. Mm -hmm. So in a listing appointment, you're talking to a seller and the it's clear that that home has to be priced at 450,000 in order for it to sell. The seller wants to list it at 500. Now, the agent has an interesting choice to make. Most agents go the path of pleasing, telling the seller what they believe the seller wants to hear. Now, here's the interesting thing. When the agent decides to do that, for whose interest is it that the agent is actually presenting that to, right? Like if the seller, if the, if the agent says, yeah, we could sell it at 500, the agent's doing it for whose interest? Certainly it's not the seller. They're just doing it to please the seller because it serves their interest in getting the listing. So let me tell the seller all the things they want to hear so that I can get what I want. Serving the seller is doing the exact opposite. Serving the seller means, hey, Mr. Seller, I'd be happy to tell you what you wanna hear or I can tell you the truth, even though I run the risk in that telling you the truth might not be what you want to hear, which would you prefer? And I go, it's the same thing with like, the, another good analogy is somebody that is trying to quit smoking. If you've got a great friend and they're trying to quit smoking, to the difference between this is they're like, man, Ben, I'm really, I'm really, I really need a cigarette. I really need to, I really need this. A lot of people, because they're so interested in getting someone to like them, they want to please them. So they get them, they go and get them a cigarette. Because mm -hmm. who's, again, whose interest is that in? It's in theirs so the other person likes them. Yeah. Serving that person would say, uh-uh, I don't care if you don't like me. I'm going to serve you. And serving means doing what is in your best interest, not as what, what's in my best interest. Does that make sense? Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. I mean, this comes up in real estate almost in every single client interaction. Because again, most agents are operating from a place of scarcity because of a lack of a pipeline. And the root cause of the lack of pipeline is simply a lack of marketing and prospecting. They don't have anybody in the pipeline. So they're constantly communicating from a place of how do I please, how do I please this buyer? How do I please this seller? How do I, what do I have to say to get them to do something for me instead of serving someone? Because there's a big risk in serving people and pleasing somebody only serves your, your own interest. Thoughts? 
Yeah, just to continue on on the on the price, um, I think often what happens is as an agent, we fall into the trap of saying, you know, they might ask you, hey, Ben, what's your opinion on the price? What do you think I can sell it for? You know, Johnny down the street said I could sell it for 600. You know, do you agree with him? You know, I'd like to work with you, you know, but what, what do you what do you think? right? And we fall into the trap of saying our opinion versus saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an advisor. I'm, I am going to look at the data. And, you know, Mr. Seller, what the data is showing us right now is X, Y, Z. And being a, an advisor presenting the facts versus your opinion so that it, it's not on you. And them saying, oh, I'm going to go, you know, hire Johnny because he's willing to get, he thinks it's worth this much because they're emotional, right? And we've got to kind of take a step back and just look at the, look at the facts. Um, and we well, talk a lot yeah. about that. Yeah. Well, I think that there's, there is this, you know, the, the second order consequence of being a people pleaser that at the time of behaving this way, that person doesn't consider. You know, they, they don't, they're just living for the moment. They're just looking for the instant gratification. If I tell the seller what I think they want to hear, then I believe they will list the property with me. Correct. What they aren't thinking about when they behave that way is what happens next. Because yeah. what's going to happen next is be, because you got the listing under a false expectation, because you just told the seller what they wanted to hear, you become the villain later. Mm -hmm. You create a world of absolute conflict later, because you wanted to plea. you thought you were pleasing them by telling them, yes, your house is beautiful when it isn't. <laughs> yes, we can get you this price when there's no chance we can get this price. Oh, yes, I can do this. I can do that. Oh, yeah, that's no problem. That's all an instant like, I'm going to just say whatever I need to say to please this person so mm -hmm. that I can get something out of it. And then long term, I'm going to, they're going to pay the price for it. You know, and this is where people get really upset working with the people pleaser. And I'll add one more piece to this, Colton, and I know you want to jump in. All right, real quick, and then we'll get right back to the content. If you're a real estate agent, you're looking to build a listing-based business, a business where you can generate a multiple six-figure income, a business that doesn't require you to waste thousands of dollars on the new marketing gimmicks, then I'm going to invite you to click the link right underneath this video to learn about our Listing Agent Academy coaching program. This is a six-month intense intense coaching system that more than 3,000 agents from every market all over the country have now gone through. And here's the reality. Here's the truth. I will shoot you straight. This program is not for everyone. This is for agents who value being around winners. They value being in a community of other real estate agents that actually show up, that actually put forth the work. And this is for agents that embrace high levels of accountability and visibility. To get the details, all you have to do is click the link beneath this video. You can schedule a coaching consultation and then you can decide for yourself. So with that being said, let's jump back into the content. It's the same thing in life. The people pleaser that overcommits to everything, and I should know because I was one of them, I'm recovering from people pleaser syndrome, <laughs> is when you overcommit and you just say yes to all kinds of stuff, because you want to please everybody because it makes you feel good, you end up delivering on nothing. And all those people you thought you were pleasing end up hating you in the end, end up resenting you in the end. That's the second order consequence of pleasing everybody versus serving people. Cole, what are your thoughts? Well, it's like a couple episodes back, we talked about the pain pendulum. You know, it's like, People pleasing with your clients, like saying what they want to hear is easy now, but it's going to be painful and more difficult later, you know, yeah. or, or vice versa. If you can do the hard thing now, it's going to make actually working with that client easier. And uh, on the topic of people pleasing, as am I a recovering people pleaser, you know, like j just a recent example that I, I caught myself uh, and saved myself and, and a, a family member, my brother found a property and my brother's the type, he's very spontaneous, right? 
And, and he's also the type where if you tell him not to do something, it's going to make him want to do it even more. Um, and so he, he, he found this property. We got him pre-approved in a day. And I'm thinking, man, with this situation, he's still in this lease for eight months. It's not the, the best property. He's just doing it because he found it for a good price. I was kind of going along with it. Like, well, I don't know if it makes sense, but let's see. You know, We'll go look at it. And I'm like, he's just going to have to find out for himself that this doesn't make sense. And finally... You know, my, my wife, Addison, is, knows this about me. And she's like, no, man, like, tell him what you actually think. And I just straight up told him, dude, I think that I don't think this makes any sense at all. And I just kind of just laid it up front and got him, got, it knocked him out of his head. And so, like, I served him by having that uncomfortable conversation up front. And, like, it's my brother, man. I don't want you to make a dumb financial decision uh, just because I, I'm trying to beat around the bush of, like, well, I know he might want to do it anyway. No, man, I don't think it makes sense, but it's totally up to you with what you want to do. So like that is such a great example. Because if you go back to the definition, this is why I started the, the conversation off the way that I did. So that someone who's listening or watching the show could have a good takeaway. They could tattoo it on their, their forearm or wherever. Pleasing somebody means that, you, that you're behaving in a way that is self-serving. It is selfish. When you... Like your, your brother example, right? What a lot of realtors do is they don't look at it the way that you were, Colton, because you actually were serving the person. They look at it, whether or not it makes sense, they want the commission check. Yeah. I don't mm -hmm. care if it makes sense or not for this person. Yeah, that's a great house. Oh, yeah, no problem. Even though in their head, they're like, oh, God, they're going to, they have no idea. They're, 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 in, right? Because right. they just yeah. want the check. Mm. And the person, who serves other people, who truly cares, truly serves people, speaks and behaves in a way that is in the other person's best interest, and in many cases is not in your best interest. Mm -hmm. Because Colton just lost a commission check. He's not doesn't care about that because long term, he will be just fine. And I know it's your brother, but this is how we should treat everybody, whether it's your family member or not. If a real estate agent can serve his or her client the same way, Colton, you did with your brother, I think you'll have a lot happier clients. People will start to trust you. And realtors can get out of this world where, I think you said this the other day, Google a realtor is or a real estate agent is and find out what comes up in that Google search. It is the scariest thing ever what you will find. And that's because nobody trusts us. Yeah. Because we reek of commission breath. Because everything yeah. we do is always no problem because we want the commission check. And the agents that can serve humans are the ones that get all the referrals, that build trust, that that have a great reputation, that have very prosperous businesses. And it goes yeah. back to just serving others. Yeah, go ahead. It, well, and, and this is even more prevalent when it comes to working with family. Um, like if you're a people pleaser and you're working with a client and, you, and you're starting to kind of just say, and, and I'll be honest, most agents, I would imagine, at least the ones we talk to, have a good a bit of integrity. They're not trying to like just completely screw the client over, but they are mainly looking out for their own self-interest. So they will tend to say things more so along the line to get them the commission. And when they do that, they start skipping steps, right? And yeah. so when you're working with family, even more so you skip steps. I learned this the hard way. I've worked with like, you know, five or six different family members, my dad, my uncles, my yeah. sister-in-law, like I've worked with so many family members. And because of the nature of wanting to um, you know, look like a good agent, keep them happy, dude, you're going to do what you have to say to keep them happy. If you're working with a client and you completely blow it, you know, you don't want to do that, but you don't have to see that client again. When it's your That's family right. or your cousin or your dad, like, you know, they're in your life forever. And so a lot of the times you do what you have to say to just keep them happy. And so you start skipping mm. steps and then you create a mess. Yeah. And the thing and, and the root cause of a lot of what you're talking about, again, this that's why this topic is so important, this serving versus pleasing people. The other reason why agents tend to be people pleasers is their unwillingness to deal with confrontation. 
Mm. Like people just suck at it. And you have to be really good at that in this business. And so let me give the audience some tactical th considerations. The, the I understand the this whole thing of like, not wanting to let people down, not tell people like how it really is because of how it makes you feel. Well, you can get rid of that feeling if you just get the person's permission to do so. This yeah. is the easiest way to do it. Yeah. Because, and I, and I hinted at it in the beginning of this episode, but to get super tactical, if I'm having a conversation with a buyer or a seller, one of the best things that we can do when we talk about setting expectations is to get the person's permission. It's like it's it's like giving feedback. It's like giving feedback to somebody on your team. It's the same way, Mr. and Mrs. Seller. There, there's really there, there's two types of agents. There's the agent that is only willing to tell you what they think you want to hear because they don't want to deal with confrontation. They don't want to make you mad. And sometimes that can be very misleading. There's another type of agent who is only willing to tell you the truth because it's what's best for you, even though in many cases, it's not going to be what you want to hear. I would prefer the latter. And when you propose that, I would argue the fact that you won't ever have a client to say, no, 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 just BS me. Don't, I don't want the truth. Just, just right. lie, mislead me. You know, you're never going to hear that. In fact, the more transparent you can be, but first you got to set it up this way, right? Because if you don't, if you start to communicate with the, you know, like on the edge of a needle, you'll offend people, right? Because you, it was in your delivery. So if you set it up the way that I'm suggesting, not only will it be better for you, better for them, people will actually like you better, which is what most people want. When we look at the, you know, the like trust, you know, that whole back and forth, everybody wants to be liked. If you want to be like, shoot people straight. Your likability factor goes up, not down. When you beat around the bush and you're flaky and you're always a yes man, you're always trying to tell people what they want to hear. People see through it anyways. Mm. Isn't that ironic? It is. And Ben, to your point, I don't mean to keep hogging the mic. I want to hear your thoughts. But you said this earlier about the data. Like when you do what Brandon said and you get their permission to confront them with truth, a lot of the times agent, agents don't want to do that because they want the client to like them and they don't want to look stupid or feel rejected when the client disagrees with what they say. Well, when you set it up the way Brandon sets it up and you present them the data, if they reject that or don't like that or get upset about that, it says a lot more about them than it does you. So you're That's almost right. protecting your own ego because we all have it. Whether we want to admit it or not, we all have a bit of an ego. We don't want to get hurt, this and that. We don't want to look silly. When you do it that way, you're also protecting your integrity um, and, and you don't feel as rejected by the client because that's on them, not you. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's critical in, in this to remove, to your guys' point, remove ourselves and remove the prospect from feeling attacked. So anytime we deliver information, we want to use third party stories, we want to use data, we don't want to say, you know, I think this or my opinion, I think you should do this, I think you should do that. That's the fastest way to get somebody on the defensive, that writing reflex, you know, and so the best way to do that is, I was actually going to make a video about this. We just, my wife and I, we just sold it for sale by owner. And, you know, like, in everything that we teach, we do, right? So I was talking to this for sale by owner and we're talking about pricing, you know, and she, she asked me a question exactly the way Colton just asked it. She's like, what do you think I should sell the property for? And the way in which we communicate that is by using third party stories. Well, Mr. Seller, sellers who decide to list at prices between this and this can expect to sell in this time frame. Sellers that decide to list between this price and this price can expect to sit on the market for a long period of time. So the question you've got to answer for yourself, because only you can decide, is which of those sellers do you want to be? It was, I, I will pat myself on the back because it was like so <laughs> great. She's like, well, I don't want to be, I don't want to sit on the market for a long time. So why don't we go ahead and list at this price? And in my head, I'm like, there you go. Like, I almost wish it was recorded. 
this is what every agent needs to get good at doing. It was yeah. her coming up with her own reasons for what type of seller she wanted to be. Mm. She got to, she got to pick the right answer without me telling her the right answer. You should do this. I think you should do that. You don't want to do that. Don't over. No, no. We just stay out of it. Nobody wants to be told what to do. So they get to pick what type of seller do you want to be? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so go ahead, Ben. Well, just to take a step back, I think when we walk into an appointment and we're, we're not prepared, we, we need to remember that um, the, the prospect, they only know what they know, right? And when we don't go in and we're not an authority and we're just a people pleaser and we just kind of like let them run the show, they want you to take control and, and be the authority in the room. So when you don't do that, you're setting yourself up for these expectations. Uh, you're setting yourself up for these comments, objections. And the only thing that I believe a, a prospect knows to ask is, what do you charge? What's your marketing strategy? How many homes have you sold? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So then all of a sudden you're on the defense. And sometimes it's not even a... Um, it's not even an objection. It's just a comment like, Hey, you know, I was talking to my buddy, Steve, the other day in the backyard, and he said he sold his house. The agent did it for 1%. Um, and you jump all over it and try to either, uh, just say, yes, yeah, I'll, I'll do it, whatever it takes. Right. So if we can come in super prepared, if it's, if it's a family member, let them see you in a different light with a clean presentation maybe maybe dressed a little different kind of kind of pattern interrupt them and and holy cow i haven't seen this side of colton before this is yeah. incredible um versus just kind of letting them run the show in the first place for sure well and ben on on the topic of the neighbor who sold the house for the low commission um and kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier about serving versus pleasing your client you know, one, one thing I say to a lot of people, even coming into this program, because a lot of the times, like you said, they only know what to add, like, what's the price? What do you charge? And a lot of times it's a reflex ask, like, what's your commission? Yeah. Or will you do it for less? People ask for discounts just to ask for them. They don't really care. Yeah. They just ask yeah. for it. Yeah. And yeah. so like one, one of the things that I do for a lot of our clients coming in, and in that scenario, you, you could say, you know, again, without getting too far into the logical side of things right away, but like my reflex answer to that genuinely serving this client is man i'm really sorry to hear that they charged less like wait, yeah. well, hold on what do you mean right a lot yeah. of agents come in asking for a discount in our program and i say i would i would never do that to you right mm. and so acknowledging that because you're actually taking away from them um and and brandon the what going back to the fisbo conversation what you did there two things i noticed that kind of going deeper on on a on a more you know deep level Number one, you didn't ask a question you didn't know the answer to. A lot of us ask <laughs> questions we don't know the answer to, you know? Yeah. So, you, so you asked a question you knew the answer to and you changed the topic on something that you have more control of. Like if you just asked the question, well, what do you want to sell it for? Like, you, you, number one, you don't know the answer and that's not something you can control, but you reframed the conversation to something that's more controllable and you know what the answer to that question would be. Yeah, mm -hmm. so true. Just reframing everything. Like the, the best way to put it is like how to ask questions to get people to arrive, to do what you want them to do and make it their idea, you know? Mm, and absolutely, that's the beautiful thing about the Socratic method, you know? And there's a lot of skills that, that, you know, it takes a long time to master these skills that we brush over quickly in these conversations. And so if, if someone's newer, that's listening or watching, you might feel overwhelmed, but just they, they come over time. But, but I think that a, a challenging thing for, for most is just getting into that tell mode or getting out of it, I should say, you know, like, here's what I think you should do. Just get rid of that. Get rid mm -hmm. of here's what I think you should do. Because that immediately, immediately triggers psychological reactance. Because nobody wants to be told what to do. And the second mm -hmm. you start to jump in with what is called the writing reflex, you know, your friend says, hey, I'm having a tough time losing weight. And you think you're helping, right? You think you're helping by saying, well, why don't you do this? Stop doing that. Stop eating that shit. Start doing this. 
the person you're just going to get them to defend you know and so we we've got to get out of that so mm. i don't know uh just it's just an interesting thing that people are scared to serve because they think they're going to lose the client they think if i tell this person the truth they won't like me and i won't get the deal when the exact opposite is true if you can communicate a better way, you will get the listing, the seller will like you, and they will respect you. That's the key thing. When you're, a, when you're acquiring clients based on misinformation, all on your need to be liked, you end up getting the exact opposite. You end up pissing sellers off in the end because everything you said was contrived to try to persuade them to do this when it was not the truth. And you will pay the price later for that because the seller's like, well, you told me we should listen at this price. What are you talking about? You wanna, lo you wanna lower the price. You told me this was the price we could sell it at. And you're like, mm -hmm. you know, Val it backfires. Did. You told me you were gonna be at every showing. You told me this. You told me that. You told me it would sell me to. You told me we'd get multiple offers. You know, it's like in the person's head, it's like, shit, that was all bullshit. That's why, that's why the number one complaint that the consumer has about realtors is they never do what they say they were going to do at the time of the listing presentation. Mm. It was all talk. So that, and, and that goes to prove that most agents in our business are just that, people pleasers. They go mm. in. They tell the sellers everything they think they want to hear in hopes to win the deal. It's all mm -hmm. self-serving. I think it compounds too because they, I think often we come into this, this business with not a clear runway to do it right. We need results right now, right? Which causes us to do exactly what you're saying, over-promise, under-deliver. We don't have a clear process to follow. So we're just kind of pulling anything and everything out of our pockets. Um, and to what Colton said, you, you look at like the questions you asked, you were prepared, you understood the what to ask, but you also understood where that question would take you. And often we say things, we have no idea where we're going um, with it, right? Um, so I think about like chess as an example. In, there was a movie I watched a while back and um, I'm not a chess guy, but it was, it was really intriguing. Um, and uh, an amateur chess player knows like one to two moves. Like I'm going to make this move and then I'm going to see this result, right? Potentially a, a grand master, which is like the top of the top in my understanding, they're thinking 12 to 15 moves ahead. Yep. Right. So if we just need to remember, are we serving them and thinking 12, 15 steps ahead? Are we thinking about, hey, I might have this client in a year versus I just need a, a listing right now, which is just being an amateur? Or are we thinking far, far down the road? Yeah, no, it's a really good point. You know, and a lot of what we need to do as realtors is be great at setting expectations. And to your point, thinking 10 moves ahead. I often give the analogy of the haunted house, right? I mean, what we mm -hmm. have to do is be really good guides to before somebody walks in this haunted house, that's the selling of a home, which we know is the third life's largest stressor, right? We got death, divorce, and then selling a house. So the best real estate agents can navigate this very high stress, high emotional process for a seller and navigate in a way to remove all of it, turn the lights on in the haunted house and let them walk them through everything that's coming 10, 12 moves ahead. Yep. The other only last thing I had on this point was to, you know, we talk a lot about the use of third party stories. And why we do that is so that you don't put the prospect on the defensive, right? Like you don't say things like, well, if you want to sell this thing house, or if you want to sell this house quick, you need to price it at this price, or here's what I think you should price it at. Because it takes the whole thing away from any reason to be defensive. It removes the friction. Now, the agent who says, well, I don't have any past clients. I don't have any third party stories. You can still use the data as the third party story. So going back to that little FISBO example, I just, I just said for the agent, you don't, I'm not asking you to make up stories. Use the data as the third party. 
So certainly you can use the data from your CMA and then you, you'll have the ability to say things like, well, sellers that priced it at this bracket tend to sell in this time frame. That's perfectly acceptable. You don't have to say, well, I had a past client and if you want, I can kind of share with you what they did to get this result. Remove that. Just use the data to be the third party story. I think could be very useful for a lot of agents that don't have a lot of past clients. Yeah. And honestly, probably a little more relevant, you know, because it's like yeah. data now. It's like on the market right now. So. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. So, anyway, uh, think about that, you know, in the audience. It, it is a little bit counterintuitive. You may feel as though it's a bit risky for you to serve people. But it's exactly what people are looking for. And if you can communicate in a, in a place that serves their interest, you'll get everything you want in return, I promise.